Hot Springs Village Inside Out is a closer look at the greatness of Hot Springs Village, Arkansas and the surrounding areas, people, places, experiences. Hot Springs Village is one of the most beautiful places on earth. Join me, Randy Cantrell, and my co-host, Dennis Simpson, as we engage in weekly conversations to explore Hot Springs Village Inside Out. Today's show is brought to you by Central Arkansas's favorite radio station, KVRE. Find them on the dial at 92.9 FM. Stream them live, kvre.com. Today's show is brought to you by Remax of Hot Springs Village. The award-winning Remax of Hot Springs Village is the largest real estate office inside the village with over 30 full-time agents and support staff. Visit them to learn more about this beautiful place to solve your real estate needs. Call them at 1-800-364-9007. Find them online at explorehsd.com. They are Remax of Hot Springs Village at 1-800-364-9007 or online at explorehsv.com. HSV Inside Out is also brought to you by Ike Eisenhower State Farm. Ike and his award-winning team have been serving the insurance needs of folks all around Hot Springs Village since 1998. Ike has qualified for State Farm's President's Club, Chairman's Circle, and Hot Springs Village Insurance Agent of the Year. Call Ike Eisenhower State Farm today at 501-984-4100. That's 501-984-4100. Find them online at ikeeisenhower.net. Call them today for all your insurance needs because like a good neighbor, Ike Eisenhower State Farm is there. Dennis Simpson here for Hot Springs Village Inside Out. Thanks for joining us again today. We're going to look at one of my passions today. That's the Lake Washita State Park. It is located inside the Washita National Forest, surrounded by it, and actually cut out as a piece of it that the state of Arkansas set aside to preserve a place called Three Sisters, which was a resort before there was even other resorts in the area. And it has three distinctive different springs that come out of the ground all at the same place. An absolutely beautiful place. This has been a getaway of mine for probably 40 years. I remember as a child thinking I, I couldn't wait to take the roughly hour-long drive from Little Rock just down to Lake Washita to go to the state park and, and see this stunning beauty. Today we're going to have several flyovers. We're going to have a lot of video inserted. So if you're just listening on the podcast, please go over to YouTube and watch this video. I think it'll really make your experience that much richer. We're flying around at the beginning of the Lake Washtenaw State Park right now is the footage that you're seeing. But in a moment, we're going to get on the boat. And I went to see Mr. James Wilburn, a wonderful, wonderful park superintendent for the Lake Washtenaw State Park. And when I called, I thought we were going to go into the office, as you saw there at the beginning, and we go into the visitor center and sit down and chat and talking heads and blah, 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 blah. No, he immediately dragged me down to the boat. We got onto the Eagle boat, which is about a 45-foot pontoon boat I'd never seen in my life. It's a massive thing. But as we got there and started going toward the boat, we saw another group coming in that you'll see in the video here in a minute. I think that was a charter group, a charter school from Eureka Springs. The Bald Eagle Tours are on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I repeat, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday at 2 o'clock. Now, if I'm not mistaken, I think they're like $14 or $17 a piece. It's a very, very reasonable fee for the time that you get to spend. They do set up private excursions. If you would like to take you and your group out and you have 20 people or even fewer, but 20 people is where they give the, the break for uh, price. But if you would like to go out tour the islands and have lunch on an island by the bald eagles they will do that for you every time i see someone enjoy our state parks and not realize that your tax dollars pay for these the state parks in the state of arkansas are completely and totally free they are zero expense to you and anyone else that wishes to come and stay here and all of the other services that you see uh, absolutely free it, it's the greatest bargain that your tax dollars pay for i hope you'll join us today i'll hope you get a chance to see some of these great videos. I believe you will thoroughly enjoy this. Dennis Simpson here with Mr. James Wilburn. James, golly, man, could, could we have picked a better day? No, it's nice today. So it's we're on a boat. Weather. Why are we on a boat? Well, you know, this is about Lake Washtenaw. 
and you cannot appreciate the size and scope of this lake uh, from the shoreline. You really have to get out on it, and uh, it's it, you know getting out on the lake and enjoying uh, the scenery and the shoreline and so on. That's really what Lake Washita is all about. Oh, it's incredible! It's incredible. So we're on a boat designed to take tours. Correct. What's the magic of this boat, and where do you get, what is this, a 35-foot pontoon? It, what is it's this? It's pretty good size. It's actually 45 feet. Um, it was initially a, a camp afloat. Uh, they were designed uh, back in, I think, in, in Lake Mead, and they were brought out here in the 60s, and we have pictures of, of people with RVs on these, but they didn't have a roof like this one does or seats. You would drive it up to a boat ramp, and you would you know, had a gangplank, and they would drive the RV up on the boat, yeah. and then you would drive the, the the boat around the lake with the RV parked on it, and they were called <laughs> camp floats. And uh, they never went over super well. And of course, RVs got bigger. never caught on. No, never really caught. Who knew? On. And so now there are several of them on Lake Washita, uh, but they're used for dive boats and so on. And in the 1990s, early 1990s. Um, I was able to convince the state to uh, to get this boat because we had such a demand yeah. for people to go out on the lake. And, and, and particularly to go see eagles, right? Eagles. Uh, we have tons of bald eagles here in the winter months and, uh, you know, this boat allows us to do so many different things because it's a large capacity boat, has a restroom and so on, but we can get yeah. along the shoreline. The eagles will, will set right in the trees, the pines, the shortly pine that we have here, and uh, that white head sticking out of oh, a pine it tree, pops. it pops, yeah. Uh, now today's, are, you know, sunny days are not the best time to see eagles. No, the, no, no, because they're, they're, you can't see them against the sun, the clouds. Well, and they're and, moving because the thermals, the heat, oh. the heating of the earth's surface and stuff causes them to go to the air and stuff. So. So we live on Lake DeSoto in Hot Springs Village, and just across from us there's a place they call Gilligan's Island. It's you know jokingly, but it's a it's a little small island, and we have a juvenile who will hang out there, come down, grab a fish, and go. And we call it sushi to go, you know. And right. I'm thinking, how does he know that fish is coming to the water right then, right there? I've never seen him miss. Sure. What what is the magic of eagles? You know they they have such good eyesight. They're excellent predators. Um, hmm. You know, and so they can hunt very well. They have their good eyesight, their ability to hunt um, makes them effective at, c at catching fish, but they eat lots of other things too. Really? Uh, other waterfowl. You know, years ago we had an issue with the eagles and uh, the coots uh, that we had on the lake, which are uh, small f are flocks of birds with little white bills, coots are. And, uh, but uh, they would hunt with the coots and, and that affected them. They had a neurological uh, disease that affected them, which was very oh, bizarre. Really? But we studied it, and it's 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 mitigated at this time. It's not affecting them like it was back in the, the late '90s, early uh, 2000s. So, uh, but yeah, 80. We know about 80 eagles winter here. We do an eagle count on January 10th each year with the core. We go around and count the eagles. We line them up and. <laughs> okay, count. you got no. Stay there. Stay there. I was about to say, how no, do you know? It's, it's a boat survey. We we you know different ways you can survey, but a boat survey is is how we do it. And there's there's four people in the boat. There's a driver, a recorder, and then, then two spotters, and they go all the way around the lake and they record, um, you know. Uh, eagles that yeah. they see and rather they're mature and immature and that kind of stuff and on average um about 80 is what is spotted each year you know I, it's up and down each year but i guess it would be average. in the, the late 90s i went to de gray and they had a boat a lot like not this nice that's right. for sure and a lot smaller and uh we went out and we were spotting eagles and it was like december january and man it was cold now we saw lots of eagles but so do they still do that at DeGray or is they, it here they also? They do. Eagle <clears throat> extravaganza, I think is what they call it at DeGray. We used to do something similar here at Mountain Harbor uh, and so on. But what we found was, you know, you always schedule those events years and, you know, a long time in advance. But the uh, uh, the weather's not always good. And the eagles don't always get the notice. They don't always cooperate. So what we do is we just offer tours year round. And so oh, we, really? we run tours year round every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday right now, we're offering tours around two o'clock for the public. And we do that through the winter months too, so that people can pick a day that's one of those days that's good for them and uh, and go out. We found that we could see eagles just as well here than we could on the other end of the lake because they're, they're right. all over the lake. So, so let me recap. Tuesdays, Thursdays, Thursdays and Saturdays, Saturdays at 2 p.m. people. 2 PM. We'll, we'll put that in a graphic below so you'll know. You bet, and just call the park uh, to make a reservation. And um, that's the end of the state 
or end of the lake and the end of the the Caddo Bend Trail. Yep. Yeah. Huh. The lake, uh, the the navigational markers, point yeah. fifty and so on. They start with number one over there near fifty. Right. They go clockwise around the lake and they oh. end back there. So one through fifty are their navigational markers. The island at the end of this peninsula is forty nine. So for I example, got it. And, and by the way, if you've ever seen, a lot of times you can actually just Google point fifty, and there are some unbelievable shots. You'd think you're in the, a nature preserve sure. or something. It's gorgeous. It is beautiful. So now there's the Caddo Trail. There's an. Is there another there's nature all, trail? Well, there's across the south side. They they built a neat trail called the Lovett Trail. Right. And it's called the Lake Washita Vista Trail and they call it the Love It. And it's open to foot traffic and mountain biking because mountain biking has become very popular with Northwoods and, right. and other things in the Hot Springs area. So um, lots of folks come here to do mountain biking and that trail runs, uh, I want to say 60 or 70 miles across the, the really? south side of the lake. Yeah. So, and, and for perspective again, we're... Um, far east end here, yeah. Yeah, far east end, but we're, we're maybe as the crow flies, we're maybe 10, 12 miles from the national the national trail, Lake Washington. Well, for the the love, it starts over near the dam, so where right. that's near Mountain Pine, which right. is about six miles away. But it goes west toward Mount Ida. Oh, um, you know, okay. sixty or so. But it doesn't miles. intersect the national trail, does it? Not the not the Washington National not Trail. Not the Washington National. Yeah, the Washington National Trail would be to the north. Yeah, I, and I really, if if you know, I appreciate what the Waltons and their folks are doing for the biking trail system, sure. which is astonishing. It really is. And if you haven't seen the master plan, yeah. they've really thought some stuff up. That it's fantastic. But that said, a lot of people don't understand just the natural hiking here. No, let me let me get us back on track. Believe that, me and back on track. Um, so the Eagle Tours are what back this way? Where's the point that y'all would go to for that roughly? Well. There's not necessarily a specific route right. on any tour. Right. Um, you have to, if we're looking for eagles, um, we look at the weather, we mm -hmm. look at where we've been seeing them, because they are somewhat, they do have certain habits. And so right. if we see a particular nesting pair that are staying in a particular area, then we'll head for that area. So we typically go out toward the west, mm -hmm. uh, toward Brady, and then cross over. Sometimes we go up toward the dam uh, near Mountain Pine. So it just depends on on a, a lot of factors, and we have great drivers. We have yeah. Susan, uh, which you just saw there, myself, and then Emily uh, Stutterfield, who's our full-time interpreter. We all get out here and, and do these tours um, from time to time. So lots of different, each driver has his own, Their own area. Path they yeah, they to like go. to go. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Wow, I, I, and I can't say enough. So Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, 2 p.m., pretty much year-round? Pretty much year round. So if you have a group that wants to uh, to go out on the lake or you're looking for a, a great group outing, you know, just give us a call. I've taken uh, pickleball groups. I've taken um, <laughs> really, yeah, high, uh, church groups, school groups, uh, civic organizations. You know, you name it. Scout groups. Uh, w w any any group you get together, and we offer a discount. If you get 25 people oh, really? together, we'll off we'll drop that that rate down to just ten dollars per person. Oh wow! You know, still, so, but man, yeah. Where, where you? Where else would you find a deal like that for ten dollars? I mean, or even fourteen dollars? Right. Fantastic! Uh, and I want to make one last plug. Do you need any volunteers at any time? We always uh, like our volunteers. We have a, a neat program going on where the Master Naturalists are helping us out. Um, we're doing who, who, who a Master Naturalist. Master Naturalist. There's a club out of the the village in Hot Springs area, and. They, they specialize in natural resources and so on. But we have an Ozark chickapin, which is a rare tree. It's very similar to American chestnut, which were right. wiped out due to the blight. Exactly. But they found a group of the Ozark chickapins living in northern Arkansas, and now they're reintroducing them into the Washtals and other areas. So we're planting small sea, 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 you know, acorns, letting them grow and, and protecting them because deer will eat them and that kind of right, stuff, watering right. them. And we've got a small grove now that here on Point 50 that we're nurturing and keeping going. Susan, uh, our, one of our interpreters, is doing a great job um, kind of heading that project up. Was it me or did we have like a fire or a tornado come through there not too many years 2011, ago? 2011, we had a tornado come through. Yeah. yeah. Opened up the canopy, which was kind of cool because once you open really? up this closed canopy, we saw fox, we saw quail. Oh. Uh, we saw lots of wildlife you don't normally see in a large closed canopy forest like this. Yeah. Um, but when that tornado came through in 2011 and opened up the canopy, um, 
then you had some some so grasslands like savannas that yeah. were created, yeah, yeah. and that created good habitat for those animals. How many acres of that do you think you had? Um, probably about forty or fifty acres. Really? It wasn't much, but uh, but it was enough to get a small covey of quail going, and we've seen red and gray fox both out there. We even see uh, roadrunners, which what? was really bizarre. Yeah, I know if you've never seen a roadrunner in Arkansas, you think, well, this is not Arizona. What sure. am I doing here? But Actually, in college at Walnut Ridge, we had them there, and I was like, what's this roadrunner doing here? Uh, I want to come back to that just for one more second, and we want to talk, in just a sec, we'll talk about the state park more. But uh, at the village, we had an area where there was a, a golf course, and they had let the area grow up. And, and we were like, okay, well, let's clear this view and get this back. And somebody said, well, isn't that going to be great? And I said, yeah, but you're going to be cutting down poke trees, real poke salad, real cool. And what do you mean? I was like, yeah, any time that light hits the ground in Arkansas with the amount of rain that we have, yeah. you're going to have other vegetation just bam. And, and you know, I know, I know you didn't say, dear Lord, let's have a tornado and get a new geosystem. This, but at the same time, it really changes that topography and that, that whole structure. Had, did you know if you had foxes before then or just well, rarely? We had, seen, we had seen gray fox, right. uh, you know, red fox, but not so much. Mm -hmm. um, so, but not in the numbers that we saw, you know, they had a little they had a little family there, so yeah. we, you know they were raising their young and stuff, and so that means that the habitat was really good for them. Well, forty and acres, that's a lot. I mean, forty for, to fifty uh, uh, of really? openings that were created from the tornado. Now, some things that we do here <coughs> that people aren't aware of uh, that don't live in Arkansas, but we do a lot of burns. Mm -hmm. You know, our controlled burns are an important part of that mm -hmm. that resource management, and so we go into those areas uh, or the 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 areas that we want to keep kind of open a little bit and we burn those every five to seven years and that reduces that growth it keeps that that vegetation curtain down um, a little bit adds to the grasses and and other um, vegetation that's good for wildlife so but it's important that you let people know what yeah, you're doing i was about to say i'm chuckling because i'm thinking of the hundreds of phone calls you there's a fire on it. we yeah. know we know we're down there yeah. we, we've got the trucks down there we're letting it go we, and there's only certain days you want to burn it's got to have this amount of moisture not Correct. this too dry not this much wind we, but we take we do a lot of classes and so we we have education it's not like we just go out there and light it um there there is a lot of parameters are set the right day the right wind all that kind of stuff because we want the fire to only burn a certain height oh, and really? just to re reduce that leaf litter and and you don't want a catastrophic fire you know that kills a bunch of trees and it's hard you know the public sees the smoky bear sign it says only you can prevent forest fires <laughs> and then they drive only you can start for right. fires. and then they supposedly. drive a mile down the road and they see me carrying a drip torch you know it's going what's that ranger doing he's setting the woods on fire you know they so, don't apply to me they no. don't apply to me i've got the drip torch right so, so you gotta you gotta educate a little bit sure. let them know why we why we do those things and actually, it's, it's good for the ecosystem. Oh, you know, yeah. this is a wood ecosystem that, by nature, was designed to burn periodically. Well, you were talking about the, the little seedlings you were mm -hmm. planting. I mean, the fire going over those. Well, we would the, protect those. Sure. Uh, we would, we would uh, not allow the fire to, to affect those. Uh, but when we do a burn, say anything rake size, like yeah. a si if, if the tree is as big as a, as a rake handle, it's usually not affected. Oh, really? Um, so, because it's a cool burn. It's what we call a, a cool burn. And we're just it, trying it, to it's not going five and six feet tall. Right. It's, we're, not... it's just a few inches, maybe a foot. And we're just trying to reduce uh, leaf litter and grasses and stuff, which adds nutrients back into the soil. And you only do that every three or four or five years. You know, well, not... I, so in the village, I get repeatedly, I'll, you know, somebody will say, well, and like I said, Lake DeSoto, it's a little valley. Any smoke that comes from you guys just sure. settles in the valley. Oh, my God, it's smoky. It's whatever. And, and, you know, uh, I think the uh, Forestry Commission, if I'm not mistaken, I must think they actually have a, a, a little uh, uh, outline online that says these are the prescribed burn days we may be burning in any of those days because they have to have a window, right? Correct. It's a window because you, you don't know what the weather's going to be. You want the right humidity. You want the right wind. You know, preferably we don't want the smoke to go back into the village. You know, preferably we want it to go to Oklahoma. Uh, so, you know, preferably want it going another direction, not into the village if we can help it. Yeah, but, but some so, days FedEx doesn't take the smoke and right. we're like, come on guys, we need the smoke to go. So smoke management is a key part of any control burn because that's really what's going to affect most people. And so, yeah, we have to manage our smoke um, and the amount of smoke 
considerably. And, and I got one last tie back in. How does this affect the eagles? What do they think about it? Do they like well, the, the lower grasslands like that? or what? They, they, they like the open shoreline. You know, really? this lake fluctuates about 20 feet throughout the year. So this nice open shoreline gives them very good perches to, to overlook and look for fish or coots or whatever is, is handy for them. And because it doesn't freeze over, um, you know, this is where they, they like to spend their winter months. And that's why they're here typically first of October till about the first of April is when we'll see them. I like to put a cookie on every shelf and we're going to go there. Okay. You ready? Okay. By the way, James, wealth of knowledge. We're going to come back with just a minute with this. Mercury. Naturally occurring mercury is in this. It's in Lake, Lake Marmel. It, and people go, oh, mercury, which it's a poison. I got it. But it's in PPBs. It's in parts per billion. Right. And if you eat enough fish, then you may get some mercury. So what's the story with the eagles and mercury? Well, I don't know that. The and by e the way, there's a two bald eagles right over your head as we're yeah. speaking back this way. <laughs> Holy cow. Go ahead. Well, the, the, in, in, I, I don't know that the mercury is necessarily affecting the eagles. Okay. You'll see some signs at our boat ramp and that sort of stuff where the game of fish wants people to be aware of the mercury. Right. It is naturally occurring. And I, Lee Howard was the park superintendent yeah. before me. He loved to fish and eat lots of fish out of the lake. And he might be concerned, you know, because he eats... Like five times a week. Right. You know, we're not quite... But you get the idea. Yeah. But if you just come out here and occasionally catch a fish and you're eating, you know, a dozen a year, right. you know, right, right. not really probably something you should be overly concerned about, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's something that naturally occurs and, and people want to maybe be aware of because we're, we're safety conscious, but, uh, um, but I don't know that it has a huge impact. On you that. would have to eat a lot of fish, You'd have a, to eat lot a lot of fish. fish. Uh, Lake Mormel, the water supply for Little Rock, uh, they have, I think they have a few deposits that are a little hotter. They have some places where the mercury is a little hotter, but you drink that water every day, people, in yeah. parts per billion again. But, uh, you know, once again, five fish a day for the rest of your life, uh, you might want to variate that, but, but so you're saying that there's no really mercury levels in the, the eagles per se. I mean, they Well, don't, I don't know of any studies. I haven't read anything in reference to, to mercury being built up in the eagles. The right. last issue that we had with eagles was, like I mentioned earlier, was the, uh, the, coots. the coots and the neurological um, disease that was affecting them. But since then, since, like I said, mid 2000s we haven't seen any of that so really uh, yeah, it's been 10 or 15 years yeah. wow james wilburn thanks for joining you, us you today on hot springs village inside out i'm dennis simpson we will see you next time thanks for watching and listening to hot springs village inside out a weekly podcast starring hot springs village arkansas visit the website at hot springs village inside out.com